intended to give you an idea of what Cauldron was like. I'm not going to talk about the trial's results, which you can read about in the report, but just try and give you an idea of how we did things. Cauldron was, in effect, an extreme simplification of harness. By using a pontoon as a fixed floating layout, we were able to reduce our requirements from two ships and a shore base to a single ship for everything. An essential part of this plan was the very close contact with MRD. The corridor was, so to speak, extended by the aircraft provided by the RAF, which linked the department with the trials site. Here is the pontoon moored in the bay north of Stornoway. And in another rather shaky air shot, you can catch a glimpse of Ben Lomond, the anchor. The whole idea depended on the use of the spud pierhead pontoon, originally built for Mulberry. I want to show you a few diagrams of the pontoon so that you can get the general idea. The pontoon is 200 feet long and 60 feet wide and it's about 10 feet deep. It normally floats with about seven feet of freeboard, as you can see in this end view. To put it into a state suitable for wind flow, the center line tanks are filled with water, which sinks the pontoon down until the freeboard is reduced from seven feet to about three feet. The wing tanks are then flooded. This has the effect of tilting the pontoon over until the surface slopes at about one in ten and the windward edge is level with the water. The wind can now flow smoothly from the sea onto this gentle slope and up it. This flooding and listing are done by machinery in compartments below deck. There are three 60 kilowatt diesel generators and three 350 ton pumps, as well as a lot of other equipment. Looking down on the layout, you can see that we had an arc of sampling positions with its center at the source, which was held on a floating boom 25 feet long. The radius of the arc is 75 feet. And the appropriate part is fitted up with animals and sampling gear for each trial. If necessary, the pontoon can be swung to adjust it to the wind direction. One of the breast wires is eased off and the other pulled in. This can be done at both ends. In August 1951, we held preliminary trials in Sandown Bay, Isle of Wight. The pontoon had been towed back from Malta, and our invaluable constructor, Mr. Vincent, had, not without apprehension, flooded and listed it successfully at Portsmouth. You can see here the pontoon with the full list on, and also the temporary sampling arc which was rigged for these trials. The uh, Porton engineer and naval constructor in consultation. These preliminary trials were intended to prove the general principle and were fully satisfactory. In October and November 51, Ben Lomond and the pontoon went into dockyard hands at Chatham. The pontoon required extensive work, and Ben Lomond had to be modified quite a bit for her new job. Meanwhile, special stores and equipment were being designed and made, and assembled at MRD. Work continued until the CNC's inspection on the 23rd of April, 1952. We had in all eight officers and 132 ratings, as well as the 11 scientific staff 
and six men of the Royal Army Veterinary. This, by the way, was fewer than the compliment for Ben Lomond alone on harness. As soon as the inspection was over, the dockyard returned for final work, which was pushed through as rapidly as possible. We were pleased with the modifications, which were, on the whole, very satisfactory. Storing began, and in fact was nearly finished, before dockyard work was completed. This gave rise to some difficulty. Time should be allowed to avoid this, and to give the ship's company opportunity for working out. Unpacking went on in the laboratories as stores were received. And before stowing for passage, the items were checked. In the animal hold, trials equipment, animal exposure units and their transit boxes are being stowed. The ship moved out to a buoy a week before sailing for fumigation which was most successful. We were completely free from rats and cockroaches. The last stores taken on board were guinea pigs, here being brought to the ship's side door and into the clean hold. Later consignments came from Porton by aircraft to Stornoway. Conditions in the animal holds were good, with excellent ventilation and temperature control. We had no deaths on the clean side. Temperature was kept at 65 Fahrenheit or a little lower as far as possible. Pelleted food was kept in large hoppers with valves at the bottom. We had space for about six tons of guinea pig food and one and a half tons of monkey food. The animals also got fresh green stuff. Water was dispensed from a multiple filler dealing with five bottles at a time. The normal ship's supply of distilled seawater was used. Water bottles being fixed to the guinea pig trays, each of which held eight pigs. We had room for 2,400 pigs and 100 monkeys on the clean side, and the same in the dirty hold. The monkeys lived in individual cages. The day before sailing was devoted to a thorough cleaning of the lab area which was attacked with great vigour. And some heartfelt comment. We sailed on the 5th of May, the last motorboat being hoisted at Chatham before we went downstream to Sheerness. These motorboats were used on the site during the trials, particularly as control boat, and what we called the taxi boat for the pontoon engineer's party. They proved in general very satisfactory, though hoisting them uh, wasn't as easy as this when the sea was rough, a frequent source of anxiety. On the way downstream, we passed Campania, due shortly to leave for the Montebello atomic trial. Last stores were taken on board at Sheerness. And we set off, quietly at first, with warm sun that was rare enough later in the year. The captain shows amusement at the engineer's expense. First, work in the lab was easy, but the ship began to roll and it became increasingly difficult to carry on with preparing the laboratory equipment. We met a heavy beam swell. It was, however, possible to do some washing and sterilizing of glassware, but when we found that the ship could roll quite a lot, even anchored at the site, 
it became necessary to take special measures about our anchoring position. These measures were fortunately very successful. The uh, cauldron mark one and lab staff getting a new slant on the situation. And so, on the afternoon of the 8th of May, we arrived. And the site looked very nice indeed in the sunshine, with a gentle breeze blowing. As we came in to our first anchorage, later on we went further in, very close indeed to the cliffs. And so we anchored for the first of many times. In the shelter, such as it was, of cellar head, which gave us some protection from the northerly swell. A motorboat was very soon in the water. Two hours later, we had our first taste of the vagaries of the weather in this locality, for it was necessary to hoist the boat again because of rising wind. So here we were, with this pontoon, ready to find out how best to use it, and then to put it to use. A few diagrams will probably help at this stage. The site was a bay about 20 miles north of Stornoway on the eastern side of the island of Lewis. Ben Lomond was anchored in the shelter as far as possible of this headland and the pontoon was in the middle of the bay. We worked the wind blowing out to sea in this sector. A trial begins with the animals prepared in the clean hold. Put into transit boxes and passed out through the ship's side door to the control boat. The control boat takes the gear and trials team to the pontoon where the animals are offloaded. Some go onto the ark for the first trial, and the rest below into the clean compartment. The control boat moors a couple of hundred yards upwind and directs the trial by radio. When the cloud from the first trial has passed over the layout, the exposed animals are put in the dirty compartment and fresh animals are brought up from the clean compartment. After the last trial, we usually did three on a day, the last lot of animals goes into the dirty compartment and the surface of the pontoon is decontaminated. The control boat comes alongside the pontoon and embarks the men in clean rig and the animals in clean boxes, which it then takes back to Ben Lomond, where the animals are passed into a lobby and thence into the dirty hold, where they're held for observation and post-mortem. The samples go to the laboratory up above where assessment is done. The post-mortem room, by the way, is here, conveniently in communication as required, either with the dirty hold from which uh, dead animals are brought, or with the clean hold from which animals come for spray experiments in the same room and then go for holding in the dirty hold. It's connected with the lab by a small lift. Corpses and dirty waste are disposed of in an incinerator here.
I'm now going to follow through the actual operations in detail. The first stage in preparation is boxing of animals for exposure. This job is started about a couple of hours before the first bomb is fired. That is, about an hour before we load the boat and go to the pontoon. The guinea pig unit was designed for cauldron. It was made to hold up to ten pigs and two impingers. The animal is held by the neck with the head exposed. The units are carried forward and stacked by the place where assembly will be finished by fitting the sampling apparatus, that is the impingers, and fresh trays are brought to the boxing point. The requirements for a day's trials was of the order of 225 guinea pigs, that is 45 of these frames with five pigs each, which we found a suitable number at each point. The units are handed up to the table where impingers are fitted. The impingers have already been prepared in the laboratory. Here they are fitted into the frames and their rubber connecting tubes are attached. The unit is now complete and ready to go in its place on the sampling arc on the pontoon. The frames are put into a transit box which is closed and hoisted onto a platform. From here, the boxes are carried through a passage to the lobby and so to the ship's side door. The boxes come through the side door and are loaded into the control boat. By hand occasionally, you can see here, or more often by a hoist worked from the deck above. This operation took about 10 minutes. You can see here the ample stowage space in the boat. The trial team now joins the control boat. Three lab staff, three vets and the radio officer make up the pontoon team of seven. The trials officer, naval officer and meteorologist stay in the control boat during the trials. The boat goes to the pontoon, a little less than a mile away, and the boxes are passed by hand onto the deck. Some animals are to be put ready for the first trial. The rest go into the clean compartment. All the transit boxes are stowed in the clean compartment, ready for packing up the contaminated units after the day's trials. The boxes are opened as soon as possible to give the animals fresh air. This gives you an idea of the normal bulk of gear for a day's work. While this is going on, other activities have begun. The men who are going into the dirty compartment to collect gear such as met instruments finish their dressing. We used essentially the same rig as on the harness operation. The meteorologist adjusts his anemometers, which are connected to recorders in the clean compartment. In some of the trials, anemometers were fixed also on the sampling arc, towards the higher side of the pontoon. The wind direction indicator, which we call Big Ben, is put in its socket. It has a dial which can be read from the control boat 200 yards away scientific officer and met man making final adjustments to Big Ben. The pontoon is now nearly fully listed. Listing began as soon as the control boat arrived. Water is pumped into the wing tanks until they're full, which takes about 25 minutes. The manholes are left open, and when the water gushes out, the pumps are turned off. The covers are then put back. The naval pontoon party was four, one in charge, one for the pumps, and two for the power station.
This gives you an idea of what the pontoon looks like when fully listed. While waiting for the tanks to fill, the pontoon can be swung, as I said, by adjusting the breast wires so that the wind direction is more towards the centre of the arc. To get back to the other preparations, the clean compartment has been opened and boxes of animals passed down. Also, the empty boxes from the animals now being put out for the first trial. In the clean compartment, the animals are stowed on racks. These animals will be used in subsequent trials. The empty transit boxes can be seen in the foreground and some more at the far end of the compartment. He is obviously a political agitator haranguing the rest about the rights of monkeys though they're only paying casual attention to him. Trolleys are used to convey units to and from the more remote parts of the sampling line. The units are put on the arc in a position decided by the scientific officer and the meteorologist after studying the wind direction. The position can be finally adjusted later on by moving units, though this wasn't often necessary. We usually used an arc of little over half a radian and nearly always got a good hit. Preparations are well advanced now. The taxi boat can be seen coming round the far end of the pontoon to take off the engineer's party. It was sometimes desirable to leave the animals the wrong way around as long as possible to protect them from high wind. Temperatures were mostly about 55 Fahrenheit and wind speeds generally high. This didn't upset the monkeys at all, maybe because we kept the animal room cool. We also lost very few guinea pigs through exposure, but they had a habit of biting one another if they could reach. In earlier trials, they sometimes came back in bad shape. A slit at the back of the box to increase ventilation and drain off urine and feces made a great improvement. The pre-impingers are filled. This device divides the sampled particles, roughly speaking, into fractions above and below four microns diameter. Vacuum tube connections are checked and manual vacuum valves opened. Vacuum's not yet on the line. It's controlled by a master valve in the clean compartment. Preparations are now almost complete, and the pontoon party begin to go below. The naval party has left by now, and the scientific officer has a last word before going off in the control boat. The bomb has been fixed to the end of the boom. It's that little thing sticking up at the end of the sidearm. And the boom is swung out at right angles to the side of the pontoon. Looking back from the control boat, as it goes upwind, we can see the boom being secured by one of its guy ropes. The lab man in charge on the pontoon has a last look round before closing the bomb isolating switch on the deck and going below. He is the last man to leave the deck. 
In the clean compartment, the radio man and one vet are ready. The radio man has a telephone for communication with the dirty compartment, radio for talking with the control boat, and controls for firing the bomb and turning the vacuum on. The vacuum gauge, showing the state of the 500 cubic foot vacuum tank. Also, gauge and regulating valve for low pressure air, laid to the end of the boom for spray trials. The last man into the dirty compartment checks the closing of the hatch and goes to phone the clean compartment. These hatches, by the way, gave some trouble, being awkward to handle and requiring a lot of care to ensure air tightness. The radio man gets the call from the dirty compartment saying that they're closed down and ready for the trial. So he goes and calls the control boat by radio to tell the scientific officer that the pontoon is ready. And then he waits for instruction. The scientific officer receives the call and gets ready. A flag is displayed in the control boat to ask Ben Lomond for permission to carry on. The range safety is controlled by Ben Lomond. The all clear is given by hoisting a pennant. The scientific officer tells the pontoon control to stand by and he waits with his hand on the vacuum control valve. He orders vacuum on and watches Big Ben closely and when the wind direction is right, usually within a quarter of a minute, orders fire. Watch the middle of the near side of the pontoon there. You can see the bomb burst and the cloud passing over the arc. The scientific officer watches its passage carefully so that he can help the lab assessment. And when it's passed, he gives the order, vacuum off. Met readings are taken in the control boat. Wet and dry bulb temperatures and sea temperatures were recorded. It wasn't practicable to take air temperature gradient measurements. In the pontoon, the vet in the clean compartment notes the readings of the anemometers that we saw earlier. There was also an instantaneous wind speed indicator here so that the control boat could call up at any time and find the actual wind speed over the pontoon. The vet and radio man will shortly be busy passing up animals for the next trial. All these film shots, by the way, were taken during actual hot trials. The radio man has given the all clear to the dirty compartment and the five men in there go up to remove the first layout and to fix the second one. The control boat can of course order a new position if the wind has changed. Units from the ark are stacked ready to go down into the dirty compartment. Where the animals that have been exposed are stowed in racks. The liquid samples in the impingers and pre-impingers are transferred to labelled screw cap bottles for return to the lab. This is conveniently done by two men working together and helped by a third who brings the sampling units. Meanwhile, the hatch of the clean compartment is decontaminated and opened from above and the clean units are passed up. No, not monkeys first, he wants guinea pigs. The vet stands on the platform and the radio man ferries the units.
a fresh arc is ready. If all goes well, it's about 20 minutes between firing one bomb and the next. The boom is pulled in to fix a new bomb, and in due course the bomb is fired. If this is the last trial of the day, samples are conveniently bottled on deck, like this, instead of uh, in the dirty car compartment below. All that remains is to clear up and decontaminate the pontoon, and for the men to change into a clean rig. Dirty gear is stowed in the dirty compartment. Anemometers in their box, and then Big Ben. The vacuum nipples on the bassoons, as we call them, are covered and the manual vacuum valves closed. Decontamination has begun at the far end. A commercial hypochlorite preparation was used, diluted with seawater. Small hoses were used for stanchions, hatches and other obstructions in the more important areas, and large hoses for the main surface. They're fed from battery-powered pumps controlled by switches on deck. The final stages are not shown. The contaminated units are put into the clean boxes and the men change into clean rig for return to Ben Lomond. Outer clothing is removed on deck. Underclothing is changed and clean overalls are put on in change rooms below deck. You can see a man lashing a trolley in the background. Using one of the large hoses, he is giving special attention to the boom, which is now stowed inboard. The control boat waits to come alongside the pontoon and put the scientific officer and met officer on board to help in boxing the animal units. On return to the ship, the boxes are stacked in the lobby and then passed into the dirty hold. They are slid down a chute and then carried to a convenient place for the next stage. Lids are taken off as soon as possible to give the animals air. The ship's side door, closed, can be seen on the other side of the lobby. Fore and aft doors shut off the lobby from the main port passageway of the ship. It was a bad arrangement crossing this passage which has been altered. The animals are unboxed here and put into cages that have been made ready by the ship's veterinary staff during the trials. two-man uh, job dealing with the monkeys. This shows rather nicely the best grip with the monkey's arms behind his back. They're full of fight and sometimes give a bit of trouble. The job's not at all easy in full protective clothing and wearing a respirator. They have to be handled with care. They may be infected and, anyway, it's important not to let them get away, as they're a nuisance to catch. The safety officer took a large number of swabs and air samples, both here 
and on the pontoon. The laboratory, meanwhile, begins assessment. Plates have been poured a day or two before in the small plate pour room, the door of which wasn't usually wide open like this. We usually used about 400 to 700 plates for a day's work. Two problems were met here. Rolling, which made pouring impossible but could be stopped by suitable anchoring, and the ever-changing trim of the ship, for which these benches were fitted with levelling screws. Assessment was done by a team of four or five using the conventional drop plate method. Dilutions were made by mouth-operated pipette. There was no trouble despite the absence of special safety devices or perhaps because of it. The plates are being packed into tins for incubation. Here the tins are going into one of the hot rooms to be incubated. Counting after incubation was done in the simplest possible way, which everyone seemed to prefer. After autoclaving, the usual chore of washing up, maybe a thousand or more bits of glassware at a session. We washed in soap flakes, rinsed in tap water, which was ship's distilled seawater, of course, and finally double rinsed in lab distilled water. When there were several hundred animals to be autopsied, a mass production system was used. Preparations going on here. The animals have been killed just beforehand, labelled and passed from the dirty hold into the post-mortem room. The principle is that each man has one job and the bodies pass from one man to the next round a rotating table, an idea developed at Suffield in 1945. The body first clipped onto the table with its identifying number on the paper underneath it. Passes to the first man who lays back the skin. The second man exposes the organs. The third man takes a snip of spleen. The procedure, of course, depends on the disease you're looking for. The plates are handed by a man working from a side bench. Instruments are sterilized by a rinse in Lysol to remove tissue and blood, and then uh, standing in acetone. Each man has a dozen sets and uses them in rotation. The pathologist taking a lymph node and reporting the gross pathology to the recorder who sits to side table. Bodies finally removed from the table. The recorder noting the pathologist's findings. It's possible with this technique to deal satisfactorily with a hundred or more pigs an hour. This system was of course only used for large numbers.
casual PMs were dealt with by one or two men. The bodies are destroyed in an incinerator in the dirty hold. The incinerator is a standard coal-fired one. This organization was, as I said, closely linked with MRD by air. A large quantity of stores was handled both ways by the Valletta aircraft. The main need was for the swift and safe transport of animals. The Valletta also acted as passenger aircraft for important visitors and staff. All the thousands of guinea pigs, as well as the monkeys, arrived in excellent trim. The aircraft had ample room for stores and uh, was comfortable for passengers. We could scarcely dispense with this important part of the organization. Our two MFVs were the usual link with Stornoway. One of them here, taking off local dignitaries after the sole occasion on which we were able to entertain on board. It was ironical but inevitable that the MFE trip from Stornoway to the site took as long as the air trip from Porton to Stornoway. The MFEs did good service, often making the 20 mile run four times a day in rough weather. Though sometimes a night run when we were lying off Stornoway was calm enough. The final but not unimportant member of the team was the Tug, our clear range vessel. Hengist, there for most of the season, was also an invaluable link with Stornoway. The meteorological side was interested not only in the trials proper, but in using the opportunity for MET research. This large boy, being hoisted out under the MET officer's eye, was designed to hold a mast steady in all reasonable sea conditions. The captain watching reflectively. Although the weather was frequently unkind to us, we were able to get off 57 trials, of which 32 were with animals and 12 were concerned with long-range travel. The captain had to watch the general weather for another reason. The trials compelled us to anchor in an otherwise ridiculous position, and strong onshore winds rose quickly and sometimes with little warning. We had then to move for the safety of the ship. We had experience of the anchor dragging on a few occasions. Fortunately, without any harm done. We had rain too, as might be expected. The upper deck was known familiarly as Loch Lomond. The ship was normally anchored with the bows to the swell to reduce rolling. Using the stern anchor, to maintain this position against wind and tide. However, when things got too uncomfortable, we had no choice but to move. The engine room department was frequently at short notice, and altogether we did about 700 miles steaming at the site, just to avoid unacceptable risk to the ship. You can just see the pontoon there, wallowing in the distance as we pass it on one of our retreats. We were at no time anxious about the safety of the pontoon, which could ride out any likely storm. There was no doubt about the strength of the wind. Because of this trouble with the weather, such an operation, 
although at a fixed site, must be regarded as very nearly a fully seagoing one. On one occasion, a motorboat, which could not be hoisted before the sea was too rough, had to make an uncomfortable trip alongside us to the shelter of Stornoway. We packed up in September 52, with trials completed and waiting only for the final holding period for animals. It was a calm day when the bar vessel unmoored the pontoon and handed it over to the tug. A couple of days later, we were accompanied by a gale over to the mainland where we'd intended to inspect Grinard Island. But weather drove us from there also, and we left Loch Hugh the following morning after a very anxious night. It was quieter as we passed Cape Roth, but the pontoon, three days ahead of us, had had a rough time and did not arrive until a week after Ben Lomond. We got into Sheerness on the 28th of September and we were glad to look round at what seemed at first like the height of civilization. There were some final post-mortems to do, the dirty hold had to be thoroughly decontaminated, and there were stores to be packed for return to Porton. While we waited for a berth at Chatham, final records were written up and packing went on. We got alongside on the 1st of October. And so we found our way back to the department. All that remained to be done was to write a report and make this film. And of course, to prepare for Operation Hesperus, 1953. the arc is 75 feet and the appropriate part is fitted up with animals and sampling gear for each trial. If necessary the pontoon can be swung to adjust it to the wind direction. One of the breast wires is eased off and the other pulled in. This can be done at both ends. In August 1951, we held preliminary trials in Sandown Bay, Isle of Wight. The pontoon had been towed back from Malta, and our invaluable constructor, Mr. Vincent, had, not without apprehension, flooded and listed it successfully at Portsmouth. You can see here the pontoon with the full list on. And also, until the freeboard is reduced from seven feet to about three feet. The wing tanks are then flooded. This has the effect of tilting the pontoon over until the surface slopes at about one in ten and the windward edge is level with the water. The wind can now flow smoothly from the sea onto this gentle slope and up it. This flooding and listing are done by machinery in compartments below deck. There are three 60 kilowatt diesel generators and three 350 ton pumps as well as a lot of other equipment. Looking down on the layout you can see that we had an arc of sampling positions with its center at the source which was held on a floating boom 25 feet long. The radials site here is the pontoon moored in the bay north of Stornoway. And in another rather shaky air shot, you can catch a glimpse of Ben Lomond, the anchor. The whole idea depended on the use of the spud pierhead pontoon, originally built for Mulberry. I want to show you a few diagrams of the pontoon so that you can get the general idea. The pontoon is 200 feet long and 60 feet wide and it's about 10 feet deep. It normally floats with about 7 feet of freeboard as you can see in this end view. To put it into a state suitable for wind flow 
the centerline tanks are filled with water, which sinks the pontoon down. This film is intended to give you an idea of what cauldron was like. I'm not going to talk about the trials results, which you can read about in the report, but just try and give you an idea of how we did things. Cauldron was, in effect, an extreme simplification of harness. By using a pontoon as a fixed floating layout, we were able to reduce our requirements from two ships and a shore base to a single ship for everything. An essential part of this plan was the very close contact with MRD. The corridor was, so to speak, extended by the aircraft provided by the RAF, which linked the department with the trial, the temporary sampling arc, which was rigged for these trials. the uh, Porton engineer and naval constructor in consultation. These preliminary trials were intended to prove the general principle and were fully satisfactory. In October and November 51, Ben Lomond and the pontoon went into dockyard hands at Chatham. The pontoon required extensive work and Ben Lomond had to be modified quite a bit for her new job. Meanwhile, special stores and equipment were being designed and made and assembled at MRD.